Hello everyone and welcome back to another video with Scruffy Tales and uh, after uh, two videos in Swedish we're now back to doing English and uh, today's topic will be cluster munitions and uh, how they're being used in Ukraine. Uh, so to start off what are cluster munitions? Well, they're basically, you have one big bomb or artillery shell uh, and you fill it with lots and lots and lots and lots of tiny bombs. Uh, I believe they're called bomblets because if it's small, it's a let. A small tank is a tanket and a small bomb is a bomblet. I guess an omelet is a small arm. I don't know. Um, anyway. So this large bomb or large or uh, large uh, artillery shell is filled to the brim with these smaller uh, bomblets, grenade types of things. Like I believe uh, the ones that Ukraine has received has something like 80 or 90 bomblets in them. And the reason why these bombs are called cluster munitions is because in midair, as the bombs and artillery shells close to hitting the target, they detonate high up in midair. And that spreads or detonate, they open up and they spread the bomblets in a cluster down onto the ground where they detonate. Now, so since you're spreading all these tiny, tiny bombs over a large area, that means that the need for accuracy isn't that great. I mean, since it becomes like a grenade shotgun, right? You sp uh, fire all these tiny bombs all over the area, and even if the larger round would have missed, then you spread all these smaller bombs over the area, and something will most likely hit. Uh, uh, it also means that. Uh, you don't need as many of these rounds as you would have uh, needed with uh, conventional artillery rounds to uh, hit the enemy, since you know each round affects such a large area compared to uh, what uh, traditional conventional rounds do. And they can be used to uh, drop high explosives to deal with infantry. Uh, anti-tank uh, bomblets to damage and possibly destroy vehicles uh, including tanks and uh, they can also contain a mix of uh, high explosives and uh, anti-tank grenades uh, to counter as many threats as possible with each round uh, each round fired um, for instance if there is a column of uh, armored vehicles troop transports, you can launch uh, cluster munitions at them and uh, the anti-tank uh, bombs obviously deals with the vehicles and as people step outside, well, the second round that uh, launches, uh, uh, that's being launched, will then deal with them with the high explosive version. So, yeah, the, they're very, they're versatile. And they can also deploy mines, uh, creating minefields in an instant, uh, without the need, uh, you know, sending out troops to place the, the mines and stuff like that. So uh, that means if you uh, have an area that you quickly need to cover with mines, maybe as an enemy is trying to outflank you, or if you want to trap an enemy, uh, you launch uh, cluster munitions filled with these mines and spread them out of the area uh, in a couple of seconds instead of uh, you know having soldiers doing it for hours uh, for hours basically so why is Ukraine getting these uh, cluster munitions oh, well the, the truth is that uh, uh, Western uh, armies, Western nations, they're running low on conventional artillery rounds. And that's about it. Uh, and there uh, 
will they will soon have uh, problems with keeping up the steady supply that uh, Ukraine requires because artillery has become so important in this in this conflict. And I mean the West relies on the Air Force to do a lot of its uh, indirect uh, fire strikes. Uh, well, not, it's not indirect when they use the Air Force, but instead of using artillery, the, uh, the West uh, likes to use uh, air power. Uh, so they don't have the supplies for artillery warfare like uh, they used to do. And But the but, uh, United States mainly has tons of cluster munitions lying around uh, and providing these to Ukraine uh, uh, will allow Ukraine to uh, stay in the uh, artillery battle to keep um, to, to not get knocked out of the artillery deal so to speak and uh, it also allows them to decide where to use cluster munitions and where to use uh, conventional artillery rounds, you know, so they can use the uh, the big traditional artillery rounds where they are really needed, and then they can use the cluster munitions elsewhere. And um, and uh, the cluster munitions, they you know, are gonna do uh, are gonna work just fine until uh, the West ramps up uh, the production of traditional uh, conventional tail rounds and uh, until they can then provide them to Ukraine once more and you know uh, resupply them with artillery rounds basically so are cluster munitions effective yes <clears throat> yes they are if they're used when they're supposed to be used, um, if they're launched against targets out in the open, you need significantly less shells in order to inflict damage. Like I said before, you get this shotgun effect. And uh, infantry are especially vulnerable, as well as light vehicles. Uh, and you can even damage uh, tanks if you're lucky. Um, uh, because you know you just shower an area with the uh, grenades basically so uh, instead of one round detonating you know 20 meters to the side of you and you duck down into cover you got 80 small uh, bombs uh, detonating all at once across this huge area and one of them is bound to be right next to you that's the theory uh, and it's working by the way, uh, but I mean, if you're in a trench line or if you're in cover and stuff like that, then then they lose effectiveness, obviously. So they are uh, particularly uh, effective against troops out, in infantry out in the open, and uh, light skinned vehicles uh, as well, obviously. Uh, they used to have a uh, pretty high dud rate, as in, uh, I mean, what, 30% of the uh, bomblets in a uh, cluster uh, bomb wouldn't detonate. And, you know, and obviously if a third or even more of the bombs you're dropping don't detonate, they lose effectiveness, but this was way back in Vietnam, basically, and I guess to some extent in Iraq, maybe, but especially in Vietnam. Uh, but that has uh, been remedied, uh, and I've seen uh, the numbers people mention nowadays seems to be down that the dud rate instead of three percent, it's two uh, percent. So. So they're much more effective weapons uh, because of this. That there are some issues with this, and I I'm going to deal with this uh, later on in the video. So uh, don't worry, I will go into the bad stuff. Uh, 
they might have trouble against modern vehicles, modern armor, but you know, in Ukraine they're being used against old school Soviet uh, uh, vehicles and old uh, Russian technology. So they will deal with the BMPs, BTRs, and stuff like that uh, without any trouble. And uh, yeah, and like all weapons, that you need to use it in the correct way to make them the most effective. So can the cluster munitions that the United States is providing to Ukraine uh, be effective? Or, well, they can, as I just, I just said, they will be effective. But can they defeat trenches? Because that seems to be the thing that people were talking about before the uh, cluster munitions reached Ukraine. Everyone, uh, all across the internet. I mean, it was YouTube comments, it was on Twitter, uh, Discord groups, and I'm guessing Facebook and Instagram, everywhere, social media said that. And people were saying that once Ukraine gets cluster munitions, they will be able to deal with the Russian trenches. So can the American DPICM cluster bombs defeat trenches? Uh, DPICM stands for Dual Purpose Improved Conventional Munition. This wonderful, wonderful name for a bomb. Uh, it's cluster bombs. Uh, each shell can, uh, for artillery, by the way, uh, each shell carries around 80 to 90 grenades, I believe. It's a mix of both anti-personnel and anti-vehicle uh, bomblets. Uh, and when the shell uh, splits apart in midair, uh, they or detonates, they uh, the shell spreads uh, the grenades out over an area of around 50,000 square feet in uh, so you have what 80 grenades spread out over 50,000 square feet yeah uh, to saturate the area and like I said if you have infantry out in the open if that happens you're in trouble and if you're in a small light skin vehicle obviously you're in trouble as well so can this approach defeat trenches like the internet claimed uh, a couple of weeks ago? Well, I always said no, probably not. And I got a lot of pushback on this because, you know, this was the wonder weapon, uh, the game changer that would solve everything. <clears throat> and I then pointed out that this has been tried before on a much more ridiculous scale than what Ukraine will be doing. Uh, because in World War I, they tried to, de de uh, to defeat trenches in the same way. But instead of tiny bomblets, they used big ass standard ordinary artillery shells. So instead of spreading 80 grenades over an area of 50,000 square feet, they tried bombing those 50,000 square feet with 80 conventional artillery shells. And that did fuck all to deal with the trenches. Saturation of an area with explosives is ineffective against trenches, bunkers, and foxholes. Believe it or not. And People just ignored this. They were like, nope, no, 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 no. This will solve everything. The trenches will be wiped out. Or rather, the infantry in the trenches will be wiped out because one or two of these bomblets will drop into those trenches and deal with the Russians. I mean, uh, that's like saying if Ukraine reaches the trenches, all they have to do is toss in one or two hand grenades and the trenches will be, you know, cleared. Not really how this shit ha uh, works, right? So, World War I, more than anything, has proven that you can deal with Russian trenches with cluster bombs. 
because it was tried, but instead of using tiny grenades in a cluster, they used big, massive standard artillery shells in a cluster for days on end, and that did nothing to the trenches. So, no. Uh, we have actually uh, another example uh, uh, from the Gulf War, 1991, when, when the Americans used DPICMs against fortifications and trenches. Uh, and uh, it's the Battle of uh, Al Busaya, if anyone's fluent in Arabic. I'm sorry for the uh, pronunciation. Uh, it was a small town uh, of 50 buildings, and uh, the Iraqis had fortified it, and they had dug trenches around this town. And the Americans, they realized they had to deal with the town to be able to keep advancing into Iraq. And um, the town was in the way of American tanks and uh, Bradley's, Abrams tanks and Bradley's, you know, the, the best of the best that uh, the Americans have. And the Americans realized that it's an entrenched, fortified position. We don't really want to go in there and fight in, you know, close combat hand to hand because that only favors the uh, defenders. So the idea was, well, hammer that shit with artillery and with cluster bombs. And that's what the Americans did. They bombed the hell out of this small town. And the trench lines rolled in with the tanks and with the Bradleys, opened fire, surrounded the town and kept firing. And what happened? The Iraqis didn't give up. They held their trenches. They held the buildings and kept firing. And they the even... Uh, the Bradleys and the tanks, they spotted RPGs. You know, the guys popping their head up with an RPG and then they dealt with that guy. But the Iraqis didn't give up. They kept fighting, kept shooting at American tanks and uh, IFVs with machine guns. And the Americans, they kept firing with their big guns and the Iraqis did not give up. So, town surrounded, pounded by artillery, pounded by tanks and uh, Bradleys. Nothing happened, so the Americans called in more artillery on the town, more cluster munitions. And the Iraqis did not give up. They kept firing, kept fighting. What did the Americans have to do? Now this, remember, this is the United States going full tilt, all-out war with all the uh, air support that everyone is talking about. NATO can't fight without air support. They most definitely they had air support. They had uh, artillery superiority in this battle. They dominated the air. They dominated the uh, artillery duels. And this was a fight. A small town, 50 buildings, surrounded by companies of tanks and Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. And the trenches held the, the fortified buildings. They held. They stood their ground. <laughs> you know, you can't fight without air superiority, right? Uh, and what, what the Americans had no choice, despite all the cluster munitions they used, despite artillery and all of that, to go in to these trenches and clear them out. They had to go into the town itself to clear it out, the very thing they wanted to avoid, despite all the firepower they had at their disposal. They had to go in and destroy individual strong points in the town. So they, so they had to bring in engineers with special equipment to demolish individual buildings in the town in order to force the Iraqis to eventually surrender. But somehow, despite this, <laughs> despite World War I, and despite the Gulf War and this battle of uh, al Buzayan, people still thought that, you know, once Ukraine gets the cluster munitions, they will be able to sweep on through 
the trenches and they will be able to deal with every village and town in Ukraine that is occupied by Russians. I don't know what to tell you. People are fucking stupid. So what can the DP ICMs be used for? What can Ukraine use the cluster munitions for? Well, like I pointed out in my previous uh, text-based video, uh, they will not be effective against trenches and buildings. That's not what they do. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, they will not be effective against any form of fortified position even the slightest fortified position. Uh, but they will be more than likely extremely effective when Ukraine spots uh, Russian infantry on the moon. I mean, if they have the drones overhead and they find, uh, say, a Russian platoon on the move through uh, some uh, tree line where they can spot a couple of vehicles moving, if they can coordinate quickly enough with the, uh, with the artillery to drop cluster munitions on those kind of targets, then the DPICMs will be very effective. Without doubt, that is what they're meant to uh, combat. And I mean, just imagine the uh, the Russian and Ukrainian practice of, you know, having troops riding on top of the troop carriers. I mean, they are quite literally troop carriers uh, because you know there's infantry are like crawling on top of each BMP and BTR like ants. And I mean, imagine hitting that with cluster bombs. So you're not only going to be, you're going to be cleaning out the guys sitting on top of these vehicles, and then you're going to, you know, destroy the guys sitting inside the vehicles. I mean, this is exactly what the Ukraine needs cluster munitions for. They, they can wipe out companies with just a few <laughs> artillery shells if they're lucky uh, I, this practice of riding it's on top of the vehicles how dumb do you get what's the what's the point of the armored vehicle if you're gonna be outside of it explain that to me I, I get it it was done back in the back in World War two back in the 50s 60s even into the 70s but come on come on it's 2023 get inside the goddamn vehicle uh, anyway and, and another thing that the DPICMs will probably be very useful uh, against considering they have both anti-personnel and anti-vehicle uh, bomblets in them that's artillery and mortars uh, if you uh, find the location for mortars uh, and artillery pieces, dropping one or two of these deep ICMs on that location not only will kill the specialized, highly trained crews uh, operating these uh, weapons, the anti-tank uh, bomblets will damage the artillery guns, damage the mortar tubes, uh, damage uh, additional equipment and uh, ammunition uh, stored around the uh, uh, the guns themselves and uh, possibly even uh, you know trucks and whatever the, some other vehicles that they use to transport uh, the uh, trailer piece itself and uh, other equipment so instead of launching three or four big as artillery rounds at uh, these uh, locations uh, where the enemy artillery is located you can drop one or two uh, DPICMs and not only uh, kill and wound a lot of enemy soldiers, you can destroy, uh, damage and destroy the artillery pieces themselves quite effectively with less ammunition used. Uh, so that's, uh, and I believe that is also what we're hearing uh, from Ukraine that they are using the DPICMs to target enemy artillery specifically. So they're pro targeting the artillery, enemy artillery with the cluster bombs and using conventional uh, artillery rounds against other targets that really need, you know, the big hard pounding. Uh, so yeah, so troops in the open on the move 
and artillery locations, not trench lines. And uh, I guess it's a couple of weeks ago by now, but uh, or a month even, uh, we found out how Russia, uh, Russian, the Russian tactics of countering uh, Ukrainian advances out in the farmlands, out in the fields. And uh, uh, it explains how Ukraine attacks, uh, finding a weak spot and then uh, going all in to try and push through that weak, uh, the weak link in the Russian defenses. And uh, Russia tries to uh, rely on drones to find the Ukrainian forces that to gather for this push. And that means you know, Russia figures out beforehand where the push is happening, they can then move in troops to set up an ambush or a kill box and then hit the Ukrainians with everything in the arsenal as they advance. And this is actually where the DPICMs can be used effectively against uh, the Russian defenses as Ukraine is mounting an assault because by now Ukraine knows when they commit to a push, they will be outflanked. Uh, and that means Russia will move troops around to set up the kill box, the ambush. So Ukraine knows that, okay, we're going to move our troops over here. We're probably spotted uh, by Russian drones and they know we're coming. That means Russia is moving troops into position. And when our cluster bombs the most effective, well, against troops out in the open, troops on the move. So if uh, Ukraine is making a push, that means Russia leaves their uh, fortified positions to set up new defensive positions. N not necessarily dug in, but, you know, in hiding or they're on the move in general. And this is when the DPICMs can be launched at Russians moving from one place to another or uh, setting up defensive positions that are not entrenched. So uh, Ukraine can launch DPICMs against the Russians that have left the uh, bunkers and the foxholes and trench lines in order to uh, support the armored push across the big uh, farm fields, uh, trying to uh, uh, combat the Russian tactics of creating the kill boxes. So the Ukrainians still have to cross these wide open fields where they are vulnerable to uh, artillery and to uh, anti-tank guided missiles and they still have to reach the point where they will breach in through trench lines and then start clearing the trenches point blank range. You can't escape that fact but you can use the cluster bombs to suppress the Russians uh, that are used to try and create the kill box, the ambush where Ukraine runs into trouble and lose five or six vehicles in just a few short minutes, right? So that is when the DPICMs can be used to help the Ukrainian assaults. Uh, not against the trench lines themselves, but against the Russians moving up to outflank the Ukrainians and also against the Russians that are moving in to reinforce the uh, trench lines. Now there is real concern uh, with Ukraine using these weapons and those concerns are justified. Uh, don't think anything else. Uh, but let's uh, first things uh, first cluster munitions are not banned worldwide and it is not a war crime to use them right it's not a war crime to use cluster munitions it depends it it all comes down to how you use them right like any weapon uh, if you use them against civilians and against populated areas then yes war crime um, if you use it against strictly military targets, it's just like using a machine gun, right? So there's no problem at all 
in using these weapons. However, there are some issues with cluster munitions. Uh, the dud rates, like I talked about before, and uh, because of this, uh, a number of countries, many countries, uh, went together and signed a treaty uh, uh, concerning cluster munitions, uh, where they agreed to ban them, to not use them, uh, basically. Some countries have not signed uh, this treaty, Russia uh, is one of them. United States is one of them, and Ukraine is one of those countries that has not signed this treaty uh, promising never to use cluster munitions in war. Uh, that said, that said, Ukraine has uh, made an official statement. I don't, I don't remember who it was, but an official spokesperson in some capacity for Ukraine said, I believe it was in 2015 that they are against using these weapons and uh, that they share the international community's apprehension towards using these weapons. And this was in 2014-2015 when Russia you know, started helping the uh, uh, Donbass rebels and uh, provided them with uh, trust munitions and uh, they were used against civilian targets, uh, civilian uh, settlements, towns, and what have you. And I believe there were uh, rumors that Ukraine was also using them. I'm not sure if that has been proven, but uh, I, I guess all you have to do is Google to find out. But I'll leave the Googling to you on this subject. Uh, I know that Ukraine made an official statement that they were against uh, using custom munitions, and I fully understood why the international community uh, was reserved against these, uh, had their reservations against these weapons. But here's here's the uh, the thing: Ukraine is running low on conventional artillery rounds, and they are desperate. They are fighting for their lives, and they are fighting to stop Russia from kidnapping their children, right? Because Russia. They are not. They are not even denying it. They have admitted that they are taking Ukrainian children from the occupied uh, territories and moving them into Russia to teach them how to be Russian, brainwashing the kids that you know they're Russian and the Ukrainians are evil people. So trust me, Ukraine is desperate, right? Their children are being kidnapped. So what, what, what would you do? They need artillery, they're running low on ammo. They have this uh, ammunition type available. That's not banned. It's not a war crime. Of course, they're gonna be using it, right? And they know the, uh, the dangers of using it. Uh, as soon as uh, it was revealed that the United States was gonna provide cluster munitions to Ukraine, uh, Ukraine made a st statement uh, and they made it clear that these weapons will only be used against Russian soldiers in the fields and never against urban areas. Now in the fields, I'm assuming by that they mean you know the vast farmland regions where there will be towns, there will be villages, uh, but they will avoid using them against larger cities and the larger towns, large, large population areas to avoid civilian casualties in the future. So they will only be using them against military targets, never against big populated areas where civilians will be returning en masse after the war. And to me, that, that shows that Ukraine, they, they understand the issues and problems with these weapons. And yes, the dud rate has lowered from 30-40% to 2%, right? So it's not a, as big of an issue as it used to be, but it's still an issue. It's still an issue. And the duds, are still they, they still remain the main concern with these weapons. And Ukraine... 
I, I believe they've shown that they, they understand this. They, they know the, the problem with cluster munitions, but they are desperate because if they don't use these weapons, well, the Russians will kill how many civilians in this conflict, right? It, it's, it's a bit of a catch-22 moment, but Ukraine, they have no other choice. They need these cluster bombs. And the issue here with the duds is that, you know, they don't explode, obviously. And that means that they will stick around for years, months and years after the war is over. And they can and they are being picked up by children long after the war is over. Right? They randomly detonate and injure civilians. And kids pick up with them, play with them, not knowing what it is, and boom. A bunch of kids die because they picked up a mine uh, that they did not know what it was. And this is not theory, right? This is not, uh, you know, uh, some uh, uh, world peace organization uh, waving the finger. This is what happens after every war and conflict where these weapons have been used, right? This is not theory. Uh, Vietnam, Iraq, uh, former Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, every war zone where the US or Russia or anyone else has used these weapons, this is what happens. Year, months and years after the war is over, civilians are killed and injured by cluster munitions. It, that's how it is, and that is the massive risk with cluster munitions. And this is why the international community uh, take issue with these types of weapons. Uh, because they are to an extent uncontrollable. And they kill indiscriminately. Right? There is no soldier responsible uh, for the use of deadly force when a dud goes off years after the war is over, killing a child. Right? And yes, Ukraine, they, they know this. They understand this, and that is why they say that we will not use these in uh, large uh, against the Russians hiding in large settlements because they know after the war's over, Ukrainian civilians will return home, and kids might find these things. And uh, so, yeah, um, another thing that uh, it's not. Uh, that it doesn't affect civilians, but it affects your own troops as well. Because if you use these things against uh, an enemy position, and then you have to move in to clear the enemy position, you know, and to make sure there are no enemies left. Well, if there are duds there, your own troops might uh, detonate one of the uh, bomblets, killing himself, wounding uh, friends, and stuff like that. So. The duds, they are a major concern, uh, even, even if the dud rate has lowered from 30 to 2%. Obviously, it was a much greater concern when it was 30%, uh, but it's, it's still, a, still a problem, still an issue. Because even if the dud rate has lowered, that doesn't change the fact that a child might die from these weapons years from now. So people like to bring up the uh, counter argument that there's no difference between duds and mines, minefields. And uh, yeah, in wars and conflicts, minefields will be used. And the argument is that since Ukraine is littered, there are literally more mines than rocks in Ukraine by this point. So adding a couple of duds won't really change anything uh, at all. Basically, uh, the counter to that argument is that when you lay a minefield, you usually mark each mine on a map. You know, because if if your own troops have to move through the minefield, then it's nice to know where the mines are so you can move them. Or if you win the conflict and you have now control over this big ass, uh, big <laughs> big ass, this big ass, 
this big ass area, you need to remove the mines, right? Because you want the conflict. You don't want your own troops, your own vehicles, and the people you are now uh, that you have subjugated uh, to die from the mines. You need to pick them up. So, uh, and uh, even when, even if there is no uh, map of the minefield, it usually follows a pattern. You, you place mines according to a uh, pattern on uh, for the same reasons. You start with one mine and then you know three or four steps that way there should be another mine. mine. And three and four or five steps that way there should be another mine. So even if without the map you know roughly how to find mines if you have to remove them yourselves. Uh, with cluster munitions there's no map other than where the uh, cluster munitions were used. And uh, there's no pattern. They just scatter all over the place. They're bouncing off trees, bouncing off rocks, uh, bouncing off vehicles, and you know, falling down a hole, falling down a, maybe down a trench line or whatever, you know, ending up in a bush and you don't see it. Um, the counter to that argument is though that maps and patterns are fine in theory, but not really something you can rely on in real life. As you, try and, as you try and clear the minefields for years after the wars are over, right? You're, we're still clearing up mine, minefields from World War II, even World War I, right? A hundred years later. So, fine in theory, yeah, questionable in reality. So, you're basically back to the original argument. Ukraine is just completely infested with mines by now. So, a quote unquote handful of duds here and there won't change anything right so i uh, guess you have to make up your own mind uh, which side of defense you lean on but yeah those are the arguments basically it is controversial for ukraine to use these weapons uh you, you you can't escape that fact. Uh, yes, the risks have been reduced, but the risks still remain. Civilians will guaranteed be killed by these weapons long after the war is over. Um, and yeah, but like I said, civilians will be killed for years by conventional mines as well that are scattered all across the countryside and hidden in every town and village so <sighs> ukraine they know this they understand this they know of the risks they have said so openly that yes we know the risk we know this will happen uh but we're in a war and if we don't use them right the, the other option will be so much worse, right? So these weapons have become a necessary evil for Ukraine. Uh, because they need artillery to win the war. And they are running low on ammo. Make no mistake about it. And cluster munitions will help them stay in the fight, stay in the war. Without cluster munitions, Russia will gain the upper hand in the war. And I don't think anyone of us wants that, except the trolls, uh, who will return now that I'm doing a video in English. Uh, strange how they didn't pop up in my Swedish videos. I wonder why. Uh, I mean, Ukraine, they can't contend with Russia in the air. So their only hope is to get an advantage uh, as far as artillery is concerned. And the cluster munitions will help them with that. Uh, it will allow Ukraine to more easily destroy Russian artillery. And destroying Russian artillery will give Ukraine an advantage in the artillery duels. And that means, in the end, that Ukraine can then more effectively uh, attack Russian positions. And uh, which obviously means that a Ukrainian victory will come all the more sooner. And this is why Ukraine needs cluster munitions, despite all the risks that comes with them. 
uh, they can't win the war without them at this point. So should they not use cluster munitions and lose the war? What what happens then to the civilian population? What happens to uh, Ukrainian children? So does the end justify the means? When your child is kidnapped, what is the alternate alternative? I know I as a father, if something would if someone would to go after my children, uh, not much would stop me from bringing hellfire to that person. So who the fuck are we to play some righteous peace Nick Westerner? Uh, concerning Ukraine when they are now using cluster munitions to protect their children from I mean the most evil people in the world since Nazi Germany That's it for now. Uh, thank you for uh, sticking with me. If you, uh, well, if you did, stick with me. Uh, if you didn't, well, fuck you. Uh, that's the end of this video. And uh, yes, Ukraine needs cluster munitions. And if you have a problem with that, imagine if it was your child on the line. What would you do to protect it? Uh, that's it. Uh, go to march Ukraine, give them hell.